kind of now an annual thing. We've been running this with the help of uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu and Dr. Makkar. Um, I'm a part of the EAST Postgraduate Education Committee, and we've had this EAST Symposium at Diabetes India now for, I think, six or seven years running. So that's always my uh, pleasure to come and interact and uh, hopefully try and get some of the uh, top speakers across Europe here as part of the EAST sharing the uh, what's best in the EAST and, and the latest uh, research. So what I wanted to share today is actually some of my own research, the, what I've been working on for the last six years. because. And this is a study called Hypermetrics, which is an EU-funded project. Um, the whole project was about 28 million euros worth of work, and one part of it was something that I led. So these are my disclosures. And I think all of you who are looking after people with diabetes know that the thing they're most scared of is hypoglycemia. I think the thing a lot of clinicians are very scared of is hypoglycemia. And repeatedly in this meeting, I've heard people talk about asymptomatic low sensor glucose, you put a sensor on someone, you put an IPRO on someone, and you see these low hypoglycemia that the patient does not know happened. They are asymptomatic. So we did this study to find out what was important about it. So hypoglycemia means different things to different people. When a physician sees the hypoglycemic trace, you can see on this trace here, lots of time in the red, lots of hypoglycemia. We're worried this patient has 19% time in hypoglycemia. If you look at the international guidance, you want to keep that hypoglycemia time less than 4%. So for us, we might be looking at what's causing this hypoglycemia. Is it activity? Is it we've got the treatment wrong? Do I need to reduce the basal? Is it the patient is having high readings at bedtime and they're correcting and that's causing hypoglycemia overnight? There's a reason for this. How can I change it? But if you look at the patient, if they're using CGM in the UK, it's beeps. It's maybe the symptoms they're getting. It's about feeling tired after the hypo. It's about feeling shaky, panicking. Often, it's about being scared. Will I wake up? One of the most important things or commonest phrases we hear from people on insulin, particularly when you're taking basal insulin at bedtime, is I'm worried about nighttime hypoglycemia. Will I wake up? I better eat something before I go to bed, have a snack. And then they have a high fasting glucose, then they come and see you, you see the high fasting glucose, increase the insulin, so they increase their snack. Yeah, that probably is something common across the world. So one of the things was when hypoglycemia is defined, we have these definitions that the International Hypoglycemia Study Group have come up with, which are one-dimensional. Sugar of 70 is level 1 hypoglycemia. Sugar of 55 is level 2 hypoglycemia. And severe hypoglycemia is if, got, um, if you can't be aware of it. But with CGM, we have two dimensions. We're not just at a level, but we also have a duration. How long are you below 70? How long are you below 55? So that's what we tried to look at uh, in our study. And what we realized was, so one of my uh, close friends, Viral Shah from the US, he did a study in 160 people without diabetes. And what they found was, um, on the right-hand side, you can see that 30% of people without diabetes had hypoglycemia on CGM. In fact, the average time in hypoglycemia in people without diabetes is 1.5%, about 20, 30 minutes a day. Actually, that doesn't happen every day. It happens you have some periods of longer duration and some days with no hypoglycemia. In fact, you look on here in the trace on the uh, side there, that's a trace from me. And you can see overnight, lots of red. In fact, the, low, the first day, it goes down to 2.6. 2.6 is about 50 milligram per deciliter. It shows that if you were at a conference, like I was at the EASD, I was walking 18, 20,000 steps a day, and in the evening, going out for dinner, having a few drinks. So if you have alcohol and steps on board, in non-diabetic people, you can get nighttime hypoglycemia. You can see the final day there, I flew back, no alcohol, no steps, sat on a plane, glucose is absolutely normal. So what does hypoglycemia mean? Is that pathological? Are we scared of dead in bed if you see that long red line? If you see that in a patient with diabetes, we get scared. So I was also involved in a study called InRange, and this was a study that took type 1 diabetes and compared Degladec with Tujeo. And in that study, there was no difference between the two insulins. They were exactly the same. But the interesting thing was they used blinded CGM. So the CGM was on, but the patient can't see the results, a bit like your iPro that you use here, Libre Pro. Uh, and they also asked the patients to report on a piece of paper any hypos they had. So on the sensor at 70 milligram per deciliter, they were having eight events per week. But on the symptoms, they're only having 2.5 events per week. So that means the patients are only aware of 30% of their hypoglycemic events. 
And these were all people who were known to be hypoglycemia aware. So unawareness was excluded with all our questionnaires. If we then said, okay, well, maybe they're picking up lower sugars. We looked at readings below 54, below 3 millimoles per liter. And again, they're aware of only 23% of those low readings. So now we have to work out what is the importance of these asymptomatic episodes. And then when we think about time below range as an overall picture, you can see people can accumulate time below range in different ways. And there are different types of hypos. When we use CGM, we don't just see a glucose of 70 and the patient being symptomatic. What you see is a long nighttime hypo, short nighttime hypos, prevented hypos, where the patients feel symptoms and treat it before the sensor shows hypoglycemia. You can see that on Monday the 13th of April, a prolonged nighttime hypo or, or repeated different types of hypoglycemia. And each of these might have a different impact on the patient. So what we did was we put together a multinational study um, in, with 600 patients, 276 people with type 1 diabetes and 326 with type 2 diabetes across nine sites across Europe. Everyone was on insulin and had had at least one hypo in the last three months. Right? They were in the study for 10 weeks and we put a blinded sensor on them to collect the hypoglycemia data. They continued their own method of treatment. So if they were already on CGM, they kept their CGM on one arm, but they used our study CGM on the other arm. If they were using finger pricks, they used our study CGM and they kept doing finger pricks. We then gave that we then created an app, and every time, so first thing in the morning, last thing at night, the app asked them a question: Did you have any hypos? So in the morning they were asked overnight, did you have any hypos? And then we asked them a series of questions: How do you feel? What's your energy? How well did you sleep? How, you know, what's your uh, mood? All those questions. And every time they had a hypo on the app, they would say, I had a hypo what the sugar level was, and how long it took them to recover from the hypo, right? And then we also gave them a Fitbit, so we could tell when are they sleeping, when are they awake, when are they active. So we can differentiate hypos that happen when asleep and hypos that happen when the patient is awake, because we know our patients are more scared of hypos when they're asleep, but they're more symptomatic when they're awake. So this is how the app worked. If the patient has a hypo, they just click on one of these petals and they say, oh, my hypo, what the sugar level was? Was it below 54, below 70, or above 70? They picked on the second, what symptoms did they have? Each of these petals, one says with shakiness. Was it low intensity, medium intensity, high intensity, tremor, confusion? All those things were mapped on this app in, in this way. And we ended up with about 41,000 days, about 102 days of years of data, that's 1 million hours of CGM. And we analyzed all of that data to find every single hypo we could find. And we ended up with 15 and a half thousand events where the patient said, I had symptoms. And we had 30,000 events where the sensor said they were below 70 and seven and a half thousand events to say the sensor was below 54. So the first thing you realize is that where you put your diagnosis of hypoglycemia at 70, at 60 or at 54, you change the number of events the patient is happening, having, right? Luckily, we found in clinical care, sensor hypoglycemia 2.2, that's a sugar of 40, only 300 events. So in 1 million hours of data, we had only uh, 302 events where they were down at 40 milligram per deciliter. So the first thing we said was, is there a difference in CGM hypoglycemia between people who say they have good warning signs of hyper good awareness versus people who are unaware? And as you can see here, there's no difference. So the, both the aware and the unaware people had the same time in range, the same 4.5% hypoglycemia, 5.1% in the type 1s who are unaware, and 4.5% in the type 1s who are aware. If you go to the last two columns, that's the type 2s, and what you notice is type 2s have much less, 2.2%, 2.1% hypoglycemia. Think about this, in non-diabetics, it's 1.2%. In type 2s on insulin, it's 2%. And in type 1s, it's about 4 to 5%. So these give us some normative data what is normal for these people. Right? It's not normal. If you have 0% hyperglycemia, you're running high. Right? This is for people with an A1C, they're getting 61% time in range. They're not at 70% time in range. They're not at target. Right? And this is just average populations in France, Germany, and the UK. We then said, well, does the ratio between symptomatic and asymptomatic events change with something called the gold score? The gold score is a standard way of assessing awareness where you ask the patient, how aware are you of hypoglycemia? One is always, seven is never. And you can see even people who say, I think I'm always aware of hypoglycemia, 
the first column shows they are only aware of the, the kind of light colored patch, only aware of about 25% of the events. People who say I'm unaware only pick up 10% of the events. So there is a difference with awareness, but Steve, even in people with a awareness, 75% of events are asymptomatic. So we had, as I said, 30,000 sensor hypos and 15,000 patient reported hypos. So then we matched them up and we said, okay, the patient said I had a hypo on his app at 3.30 p.m. We said, can we find a sensor hypo within one hour of when he said he had a hypo? Because it might be that their recollection is out by 20, 30 minutes. When we tried to match them up, the overlap was only 50% for the symptomatic hypos. So 50% of the time when the patient says I have symptoms, there is no hyperglycemia on CGM. And 70% of the time when there's hyperglycemia on the CGM, the patient doesn't have symptoms. So what we realized is that sensor hypoglycemia and what the patient experiences, feels as hypoglycemia, seem to be two separate things. Um, so we then looked at what percent of those events were, is it different between type 1 and type 2? And actually it's pretty consistent. It's between 20 to 30 percent in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So if you see some hypos on the sensor, you can't be guaranteed that these are the times when the patient felt hypoglycemic. And we can't expect that they should have been hypoglycemic at those times or felt hypoglycemic because half the sensor's hypos are asymptomatic. So then, now is there a relationship? So we then did some correlations and we looked at those people with more sensor hypoglycemia, did they have more patient hypoglycemia? And it is true that if your time below 70 goes up, the number of patient reported hypos goes up as well, but that correlation is pretty poor. It's not a direct correlation. As you can see, for every 1% change in time below range, the weekly rate of patient hypoglycemia goes up by 10%, 9%. So there is some correlation, but not a one-to-one -one correlation. Then the different question was, so many of these hypos are asymptomatic, the patient isn't feeling them. Does it have an impact on that patient? So based on the literature, we find that hypoglycemia can potentially affect your diabetes in these nine different domains. Fear of hyperglycemia, quality of sleep, your mood, how sharp you're feeling, cognitive function, product work, and social function, negative affect. So those questions every morning and evening, the patients were answering. And we could compare an individual's response on a day with no hypoglycemia to their response when they had a hypo. And that will tell us what's the impact of having a hypo and what's the impact of having an asymptomatic hypo. So in this chart, what I've got is A, the column A is the score of cognitive functioning, mood or sleep quality on nights where there is no hypoglycemia. Column B is when there's only a sensor hypo. And what you can see that I hope is that there is zero impact. If the patient did not feel the hypo, it doesn't impact their mood, sleep quality, cognitive functioning, or any of those nine domains. But as soon as they feel the hypo, they're woken by it, you can see a drop, 5% drop in their mood, in their sleep quality, in their quality of life. Now it doesn't matter how the hypo was detected. So in this column, A is again their scores and those questions when they don't have a hypo. B is when they, when they, if they have a sensor, they just do a blood check and they, they find out, oh, I'm low, without symptoms. And C is when they feel symptoms and then they, then, then they say they've got hypoglycemia. And you can see it's probably a little bit worse if you have symptoms, but, it, but even the asymptomatic hypos have a negative impact. And then we looked at to see, well, okay, the asymptomatic hypos, maybe because so many of them were at a high glucose, we're not seeing something. So we then started to see, well, is there an impact of the asymptomatic hypos that are down at 50 or 40 milligram per deciliter? It doesn't seem to make any difference. So it gives the question, do we worry too much about asymptomatic low sensor glucose? We're using a lot more CGM, we're seeing a lot more hypoglycemia. Are we getting worried? Because... Ultimately, a lot of people say hypoglycemia is a barrier to control. But my personal opinion is that the fear of hypoglycemia in physicians transmitted to patients is a bigger barrier to control than the hypoglycemia itself. Right? So uh, I need to here walk a tightrope because, of course, we all know bad things. I've had patients die of hypoglycemia, right? One. In 20 years of managing a hypoglycemia service, I've had one person die, and that's tragic and that's horrible. There was this one study in pediatrics which looked at seizures with hypoglycemia 
And to have seizures, they had to be below 40 milligram per deciliter for at least two hours. So there is that, not just the depth story, but the duration story to hypoglycemia, right? Also, Simon Heller, one of my previous mentors, did some study in type 2 diabetes looking at QT changes in the heart. And again, you can see there that in the top line, if I just show you on the left-hand side, the top is the QTC, and you can see that after about the night starts at midnight, by probably about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, the QT is increasing. And the, but the sensor glucose but the, has to be down for 4 or 5 hours before you get a change in QT. So again, short, sharp hyper that the patient picks up probably doesn't have an impact on brain function for, for unconsciousness or on the heart for QT changes. We know that these were studies, again, done as part of our Hyperresolve project. Um, if you're down below 50 for one hour, we can see some changes in the heart that are seen up to an, um, a week later. On the left there, that's called a volcano plot. That's a proteomics scan after experimental hypoglycemia. So in the, we took people to the lab, dropped them down to 50 for one hour, 50 for a full hour, and then measured the inflammatory response a week later. And you can see that volcano plot showing an increase in a number of proteins involved with inflammation and platelet activation. So yes, staying down for a prolonged period has a problem, but these short hypos that many people get don't seem to make a big difference. And if I look back at the DCCD data, you can look here that although in the intensive arm and the con conventional arm, you can see the rate of severe hypos was 11.6% versus 6%, if you look down at cardiovascular, you can see the rate of cardiovascular in the intensive arm was 20% versus 25% in the conventional arm. So by being scared of hypoglycemia and running people high, we are pushing people towards more um, cardiovascular disease. And actually there are data I'm not showing here, but there's a lot of data in pediatrics. I don't know how many pediatricians there are, but in pediatrics, an A1C of 8.5% or higher uh, reduces the child's IQ, right? There is strong evidence. There's uh, evidence on brain scans. Uh, Tale Batlino shows these data, showing you have reduced white matter connectivity. There's lots of data showing reduction of IQ and reduction of cognitive performance with high A1C. Actually, the data for severe hypos is that it doesn't make a difference. In the DCCT, again, with higher HP1C, patients had reduced psychomotor efficiency, reduced motor speed. But people with up to five severe hypos up to five severe hypos had no impact on their brain function in the DCCD study. So a lot of patients are scared with the repeated hypoglycemia, certainly in the UK. People get scared that, will I get uh, brain malfunction? Will I get more cognitive impairment? The opposite is true. If you run your A1C at 8.5%, you will increase your chance of dementia. But up, you know, up to four, and how many people have like five severe hypos in a year? The occasional severe hypo, one in 10 years, even that doesn't seem to have a problem. There is no evidence showing that asymptomatic or non-severe hypoglycemia has any negative impact on brain function long-term. Short-term, yes, but not long-term. Now, in type 2 diabetes, I've got one or two slides just on type 2 diabetes, and this is a bi-directional relationship of hypoglycemia and dementia. So people with pre-existing subclinical Alzheimer's, which is linked to type 2 diabetes, have a higher risk of severe hypoglycemia. But people with severe hypoglycemia have a higher risk of dementia as well. And again, the studies, until you do a prospective cohort, it's very difficult to work out which comes first. But it, it kind of makes sense that if you have dementia, your food intake is going to be variable, your drug intake is going to be variable, your risk of severe hypoglycemia is going to be higher. And if you've got an already compromised brain and you insult it with severe hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemia that requires third-party assistance, then you might progress to dementia as well. So that kind of makes sense to me. So in summary, I'm, I'm on time. Most episodes of CGM hypoglycemia are asymptomatic, 70 to 80%, irrespective of awareness. We need to accept that and expect that and not be scared by it and not scare our patients by it. CGM alone cannot differentiate awareness status. I actually found this result. I published on this in 2005 and then repeated the same study again. Asym asymptomatic sensor hypos have a very limited impact, if any, on patient reported outcomes. A recognized episodes, but when the patient feels symptomatic, that definitely has a negative impact on the patient and we need to reduce those episodes. 
CGM hyperglycemia is not the same as patient reported hyperglycemia. So in clinical studies, academics like me need to make sure we report both. And I think these studies hopefully can influence the way we educate people about the risks and dangers of hyperglycemia. Thank you.